welcome to the October 30th Plant Path and Micro Seminar. We are going to talk to you today about the Integrated Pest Management Program, uh, which is part of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And we are headquartered in the Plant Pathology and Microbiology Department. My name is Adam Sisson. I've been at the university since I started as an undergraduate hourly all the way back in 2003 for Dr. Mark Gleason. Thank you, Mark. It was very delicious field work, apples, strawberries, <coughs> and uh, now I work as part of the IPM program for Dr. Darren Mueller, and one of my primary responsibilities is the development of educational material on corn and soybean insects and diseases. And my name is Lina Rodriguez Salamanca. I am a plant disease diagnostician at the Plant Insect Diagnostic Clinic. I focus on uh, horticulture, ornamental, or specialty crops, all those, uh, anything that is not field crops, um, I deal with, and that will be plant samples and also extension in general. We're going to start things off a little bit differently by showing you a short video that our video videographer Brandon Clanky produced, and I just had to show it to you because I'm excited about it. is Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. I'll probably use both interchangeably throughout the presentation. So we'll use a definition provided by the USDA. IPM is a science-based, sustainable, decision-making process that uses information on pest biology, environmental data, and technology to manage pest damage in a way that minimizes both economic costs and risk to people, property, and the environment. And when I say pests, I mean lots of different organisms that cause problems for people. It could be disease-causing pathogens, it could be insect pests, it could be weeds, or rodents, mites, etc. So essentially, pest identification, monitoring, and record-keeping inform multifaceted, economic, and least harmful management strategies. And these could include resistant varieties, pesticides, such as fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, etc. Mechanical or physical controls. One example of this would be sealing cracks in a foundation to keep insects out cultural controls. An example of this is manipulation of a planting date in order to avoid a pest population. Or biological control, which is probably my favorite one. There's all sorts of neat uh, things that go on with biological control. Entomopathogens, pathogens that infect insects, insects that eat other insects. If you need a great storyline for a horror movie or sci-fi movie, just get a magnifying glass out and look at the insect world. They do terrible things to each other. For example, one of those things, there is a parasitic wasp that will lay eggs in or on a soybean aphid. That wasp hatches as a larva, and that larva tunnels through the inside of the soybean aphid, eating it while it's still alive, and that results in the death of the soybean aphid. I'm sure the wasp is having a much better time than the aphid. Eventually, the aphid dies. And it bloats up, and the adult wasp cuts a nice little portal in the side and crawls out. It's horrifying, but neat at the same time. <laughs> hey, IPM at ISU, the purpose is of, of, of our program is to provide research-based educational programming on pest management and related topics. And this is accomplished through the development of diverse and meaningful outputs and partnerships, and we're going to select a few of those things today and talk about them in a little more detail. And this results in relevant, needs-driven resources um, delivered to Iowans and others, and it creates significant impacts in their lives. I've also used the term ISU Extension and Outreach, and some people in here might not know what Extension is. 
Extension, people who work in Extension, their job essentially is to take research data and present it to the end user in such a way that it is understandable to them. In the IPM program, we do that on pest-related topics. We take pest management science and deliver it to the end user so that they can use it and profit and, you know, and, and uh, experience improved livelihoods because of it. But there are lots of other programs within Extension. There are people who teach folks how to cook healthier meals or how to improve their parenting skills. Who is IPM? So the director of the IPM program is Dr. Darren Mueller. Uh, you can see by this picture that he recently won a very prestigious award in the anthropological journal known as People. Um, very high rank journal. Dr. Laura Jesse is the director of the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic and also recently became co-director of the North Central IPM Center. Congratulations, Laura and Darren, too. Ed Zaworski, fellow up here. Um, that's how he normally looks. Uh, he is a diagnostician uh, focusing on row crop diseases in the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic. Sorry, Ed, I apologize. You're very handsome. Brandon Clanky, um, that's, not, that's not how he normally walks. He is the IPM team's videographer. He made the video that you just saw and we'll watch another one uh, by him later. The guy on the top, all the way on that side, is Warren Pearson. He directs the Field Extension Education Lab, which is a facility located outside of town. Uh, and what they do is they provide education for field scouts, students, agronomists, uh, ag business employees in small corn and soybean plots that they purposely mess up in and they bring folks out there and teach them how not to mess up in their own commercial fields. Maya Hazley, she is the uh, IPM program's um, uh, youth educator, so she brings crops information to youth, and so she works with 4-H. Um, this is Kent Sisson, he works out at the Field Extension Education Lab. He's like MacGyver without the mullet. Uh, you give him a paper clip and chewing gum and he can fix anything. Center bottom is the newest member of the IPM team. Ethan Stetzer, he comes to us from the East Coast, and his, uh, he is a journalism background, and, and, so, and so he manages some of the communications, so he makes us look better than we actually are on social media, uh, Lena and myself. So as I mentioned earlier, the IPM team does many activities. This includes diagnostics, workshops and field days for a variety of clientele, um, ag business clientele, or master gardeners from the Amish. Teach college courses. We do a little bit of research. You can see down here, this is a new bit of research we did where we actually had a hail machine that simulated hail injury on corn and soybean by shooting it with ice. It was a fun, very stress relieving research project there. Um, we develop videos. Um, we lead various groups, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Laura is now a co leader of the North Central IPM Center. We do publications and articles, and, and this is one of the main things that I focus on. So um, I developed content in part for books like this, and I'm going to pass these around if anybody wants to take a look at them. So please feel free to pass those around. Um, we apply for grants, and in fact, a lot of our activities and um, salary on the IPM program are grant funded. We use social media to do outreach to help uh, promote IPM. We have partnerships with ag business or commodity groups or um, <coughs> others, and, and more. And, and, and today, uh, the, focus, or the topics we're going to discuss are, Lena is going to go through some diagnostics and plant and insect diagnostic clinic workshops and websites. And then I'm going to touch briefly upon uh, an event called the Crop Scouting Competition, an organization called the Crop Protection Network, uh, a partnership that the IPM program had with faculty in the College of Design, and a project we did that used social media to track disease. Okay, so let's move back to um, the big umbrella of IPM. Um, and I just remembered this doesn't work. <laughs> so um, if you think of IPM, we're trying to go through all of these steps uh, with the idea that um, people in their houses, uh, producers, um, scouts, everyone is taking decisions with information uh, that actually um, is avoiding unnecessary treatments. And sometimes a decision is not to treat or there's nothing to do about it. But the first step would be that we need to know what is the problem identify it, right? So when we uh, think about diagnostics, um, in the clinic, we are part of the National Plant Diagnostic Network. There is uh, one of those laboratories pretty much in every land grant who may be affecting your bottom line. You may be using treatments that you don't need and therefore putting money where you don't need to put it. So within our IPM uh, team, 
we're working not only with um, growers of field crops, but also specialty crops producers that could be growing in the greenhouse, in high tunnels, uh, in the field. Uh, we also work with um, people that in their backyards, they want to have a garden. And one of the most interesting clientele um, that was to me when I came to Iowa State is actually the people that are um, specializing in the landscape. So there are people, arborists, that we call them to uh, commercial providers. They are looking and to plant ornamental nursery trees um, and woody in general, woody plants that will be placed in the landscape in urban situations or in a woodland situation. So that you know, communication with all this uh, variety of clientele really makes for an interesting uh, <coughs> job here. So if we think about the monitoring part of IPM, we spend a lot of our time as an IPM team um, teaching people how to observe symptoms, regardless if it is you know, any of the, the clientele that we um, work with. Either look at the big picture of side characteristics, surroundings, the pattern on the side, but also going to the detail. What is the, the plant, um, the plant tissues, the pattern in the, partner, pattern in the plant, uh, and what are the tissues that are compromised. And then we tell people collect information and write it down, right? So sometimes that means take a photo. You don't have to have a notebook, but take a photo or a video of what you're seeing. Um, if you're thinking that you may be sending a sample, you can use our submission form to collect information. Um, but often, just taking notes and describing the situation, where it started, what is the problem. Um, and from there, um, here we go. So, because of that, we have worked really hard on improving our web presence. We have added a lot of photos and videos to our websites to make sure that people are understanding what type of information they should be collecting when they are uh, looking at plants and thinking about sending a sample. Um, and then we're making sure that we are reaching to people that learn differently through videos, photos, and different trainings. And more than anything, we want to be easy to find to all islands. So let's say that someone decided it's time to collect a sample because they're unsure of what they're seeing, they think it's new, or they're not sure, you know, they change varieties, what this may be about. One important thing that we always try and um, convince people is make sure that you send us something that is fresh. Keep in mind that there's going to be some transit time, and I cannot tell you how many times that and I tell this in Laura to, and not that impossible. And we do get a lot of dead things, surprisingly. I think that you know, the only reference that we have in our clients is they may be watching medical shows or thinking about their own experience going to their physician. Um, and so this means that sometimes they think that we can do uh, necropsis, like, you know, someone is, has died and then someone, a, med, a doctor will check and say, oh yeah, it was a heart attack. We cannot do that. So it, it's hard for us to try and explain that to our clientele. Not dead, please, please, pretty please. And also, don't wait until things have gone to a point where we are finding a lot of extra things that are going to only confuse the situation. So representative samples are important. All as much clues and information as possible. That really helps us out um, quite a bit. Um, so now, even for plant problem diagnosis, we have a, you know, particular um, instructions for different groups, conifers, field crops, fruit and hops, Again, photos, videos um, of that sort. There are some um, plant problems that are more difficult. And in fact, for trees and moodies, we recommend that people send a photo first. Um, you know, with the plant diagnostics, sometimes pinpointing what the pathogen is, is a big deal. If um, you're thinking that the pathogen is in the roots or in the vascular system, <coughs> then we will request a completely different sample. But if we don't know, if we don't see that sample, that, that photo ahead of time, people may just go with a couple leaves and then we can't really test for that pathogen. Um, and of course, you know, we, uh, there is a lot of things that we can do with our smartphones now and taking those photos um, can be a challenge for all of us, you know, knowing what the right light is, um, how to focus. And so, you know, I, I love the people that watch videos can go to uh, this video that talks about what it is we're hoping to see on photos. We also have a handout and a page that those that like to read things can go to. 
Now, if once the, the plan gets to us or the sample gets to us, what goes on is that that sample gets entered into a database. There's a lot of documentation that we do. We take photos. There's a lot of forms. Um, we do triage, and from there, you know, it can be any other testing um, that we do uh, in general. So this is just an example of how our clinic queue works and who is assigned to, uh, and all the information that that we go through. So once we're decided, um, once we have, you know, this is kind of like a workflow. Um, ideally, have digital photos that will help us with a lot of clues. Then clues on the submission form describing the situation, when it started, how it evolved, um, treatments that may have applied already, uh, and a sample that we will then observe and test. And then all this get tied together because we need to consult with experts. There are you know, people in our department that can help us a lot and we appreciate uh, your help. We're always reaching out also in other departments, the horticulture department, the agronomy department, but also uh, you know, regional people that we reach out to and nationally too. So quickly here, when we um, get to a sample, um, we get a sample in there, the first thing that we do is we look at it a lot. We will look at the symptoms from there, uh, describe what is the receipt, what are the plants, uh, tissues that are involved, and then um, we will use our magnification to look for signs of the pathogen, uh, evidence either of fungal bodies, bacterial streaming, et cetera. Um, and sometimes if they're not there, then we'll do an incubation, a moist chamber to allow the, the pathogens to um, show their self develop on that tissue. Depending on what it is, and if we are thinking it's a virus, then we have some ELISA and some test strips that we can run on different samples. Uh, often we need to culture the tissue um, and then from there uh, we'll allow those pathogens to develop in culture and consult with experts. So we put all this information together in a report and so in here on the report we tell the client what we saw on the sample, what the results of the test were, the information on the past pathogen or disorder, meaning non-infectious problem, um, we give recommendations, anything within the IPRAM umbrella, sometimes it's about sanitation, rotation, uh, sometimes it's um, what to plant next on that location. And as all, it's not always prescriptive. Not every time we're telling go with this fungicide, go with this insecticide. Sometimes it's like try this variety, or why don't you think about planting this other tree. Now from there, and this is what we, not, we can control is they, the client, decides what to do. They decide if they need to remove or treat the plant. Um, and they also have to weigh what are the implications of the diagnosis. Is it a short term? And if so, what to do? Or is it a long term implication in what to do? And often, because of the um, gardener um, clients that we work with, sometimes the, the answer is do nothing, but just learn, for, learn from the future. So just in a, in a nutshell, all that we're doing here is connecting the general public with science, explaining that when we identify a problem, it's because there is this organism behind. Um, and so we extend that type of motto to a lot of programs that we're involved with. And this one is a particularly fun one as a master gardener. Some of uh, the grad students have volunteered and have helped greatly, and we appreciate your help. And if, uh, if this is news to you and you're a grad student, you should definitely consider for next year because it's a lot of fun. And this particular set of people, the master gardeners, are so curious, so willing, they have great questions, and it gives you that opportunity to actually explain what you do. It's like you're talking with your mom, your dad, your aunts about what it is you're doing. So it, it's, it's really great. Now on that, connecting people, not only the master gardener, with resources, we do have a the horticulture and home pest news, short as HHBN is how we refer to it. But this particular website is um, a compilation of things that the clinic site had before, um, and also the horticulture department had. Um, there is a great newsletter that we put together pretty much every month once um, a month, and it has timely uh, information and you can subscribe to it. Um, we also have the encyclopedia articles, a lot of insects and diseases, 
in that same page. Um, and some of the grad students that have uh, been part of the extension experience class have um, helped us with, you know, beefing up the encyclopedia articles, creating new ones, make them more interesting, put in uh, photos. Another um, opportunity for grad students to, you know, gain knowledge and, and experience on extension. Extension publications, we have uh, around 40 different publications on different insects and diseases uh, that we try to keep up to date uh, and in some cases uh, translated into Spanish. And the last thing is um, we also engage um, people on social media because that's where apparently everyone is, right? Even the president or, you know, everyone is trying to be, you know, get an information. And so we have a great opportunity to actually bring science-based information into our social feeds. So we have a Facebook page. If you haven't um, liked us, please do check it out. We put a lot of uh, cool things in there. Um, and, and we also try through our social presence to put nice snippets of, we're trying to explain to our clientele what is that we're doing on our little rooms in the diagnostic clinic. What is that goes behind the doors to check what are the tests that we do. And this is a great uh, video that Ed had produced with uh, Brandon that really explains how is that we go about testing for that disease. Now for those of you that like Pokemon Go and we're wondering about, you know, is there something like that for invasive species? The answer is yes. Uh, the National Plant Diagnostic Network has a first detector program and it's been around for almost, I want to say 10 years. Uh, it's been recently revamped. Um, in this particular website, you can learn about target pests. There are short information, <coughs> video, uh, photos that you can learn what to look for. You can take a trainings online, you can attend a training on a classroom situation, uh, become an educator if you like to, um, but more importantly, they have this really nice reporting uh, ability now that if you use your phone and you know what you're looking for, you think that you have one of those target pests, um, you can take a picture, you can put a pin on where you found it. If you're hiking somewhere and you think you found one of those target pests, you can then report it, and this will go to an identifier, an expert identifier, that will verify uh, or not if that's the pest that we're looking for. More NPGAM programs that have e-learning. Protect US is one that is focused on detection of exotic pests. I mean, who knew that this uh, mollusk can be a really good, big problem in agriculture, and the truth is mollusks are, have been um, intercepted in different ports in the United States. <coughs> And if they hang around, they just eat anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's the type of uh, effort that this particular um, group is doing. Now, the uh, Sentinel Plant Network is a group of people from NPDN and the public garden community. And so if you think about Ryman Garden, sort of the Moy Botanical Garden, or pretty much any garden that you visit, you notice that there are plants in there that are not native. And so they bring different things, you know, for show, for the fun of having um, interesting plant varieties. And so it's important to train the people that are all the time in the garden um, to look for what are the pests that may come with those particular plants. Um, and any, anyway, what is that they should be looking for if there are problems of that nature. Now we amplified the um, message from different invasive species um, consortiums like the do not move uh, firewood. So if you like to camp, uh, just keep in mind that by moving wood, you may be also moving pests. And that may be the case of uh, emerald ash border. Uh, there is a lot of pests that will hitchhike on wood that you may be moving between states. So try not to do that. And another invasive that has you know hit home in Iowa um, as Emerald Ash Border started, you know, in 2015 when I arrived in Iowa, uh, and then it's been kind of spreading um, out. More invasive species. Uh, this year we have a jumping worm, uh, the Laura confirmed, and um, and so this one is one that we have heard in our region for a little bit in Illinois and Wisconsin, and we were kind of like monitoring and then. Uh, it's here now. The problem with this one is it's uh, 
kind of a form that will take over resources, compete with native ones, and if it gets into um, a woodland situation or areas, nature areas, it can start causing some ecological damage in there. We also, in the clinic then, uh, we have a lot of hands-on recognizing problems, learn what to look for, learn what to monitor for. Uh, we can do, um, you know, we do producer or growers that, you know, are either starting midway or just want a refresher. Uh, we like to have samples and have them look at things, insect disease and disorders too. And then, of course, that category that the, the arborist, the service provider, also recognizing problems, recognizing that not leaves, you know, leaves is not the right sample for some of those problems, uh, or what type of sample is that we need uh, and what to look for. Um, this year, and, and we have the opportunity to go and do an on-site clinic with Amish farmers, um, and this one is really fun, was really fun. So Amish is a segment of our clientele that is hard to reach, so they don't really have access to the internet. Uh, they sometimes don't even have a phone number. Um, sometimes all that we get is their phone, that their um, address at home. So we went to this auction. Um, they grow all sorts of things, from pumpkins, mums, vegetables, fruits, you name it. Um, and we went to this auction, and then it was advertised that you can bring your samples. So we can check them right in there. Um, and then we also took some demos and things. But that day, um, an Amish grower had brought this beautiful downy mildew um, that we got to you know, show them what were the structures um, and take pictures of it and explain what to do about it. And we're always thinking of, way, we're always thinking of ways to um, make it fun for people to learn what to look for, what to scout for. Um, and so this display we did on the Great Plains Growers Conference where we had different symptoms of the problems, signs, this, this was fruit and vegetables. And so they, they um, had this quiz so they could test their knowledge. And the first 10 of the day, um, with 80% of the correct answers, uh, would get one of the Midwest uh, production guides that we also contribute and added every year here at Iowa State. All right, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, an organization called the Crop Protection Network. Crop Protection Network is a product of land grant universities and it was formed by Darren Mueller and uh, some of his colleagues uh, surrounding land grants. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, Kirsten Wise when she was at Purdue and uh, Carl Bradley when he was in Illinois and now they're both in Kentucky, uh, Lauren Giesler in Nebraska and so on and so forth. But these folks decided to form an infrastructure for collaborative outputs between multiple state universities. And the goal of this was to minimize duplication of efforts by extension personnel. Take for instance, if Darren Mueller wants to produce an extension publication on white mold, a disease of soybeans, uh, uh, basically uh, to help farmers identify the disease and manage it, he would have to write it, he would have to find uh, pictures for it, he would have to find someone to do a layout of it, and then he would have to distribute it. Well. Damon Smith would have to do the same thing in Wisconsin or, or Geisler in Nebraska and so on and so forth. But if they all teamed up and did one publication that leveraged all of their expertise and was applicable over a wide area, that would save time and use all of their, especially Aaron's amazing IQ to uh, make those publications phenomenal. <laughs> at the main hub, the crop protection network.org, so please visit there if you have a chance. Um, so far we've produced 40 plus extension pubs and there are lots more in progress and they are on a variety of topics, uh, corn, soybean, and wheat related topics. We have everything from mycotoxin FAQs to um, uh, frog eye leaf spots, so publications on single um, diseases. Uh, this is a sudden death syndrome publication that was translated into French for um, French growers, in, uh, or for Canadian growers uh, up north. Um, so far we've had 99 participants from 30 universities and other groups, such as the USDA or the Ontario Ministry of Ag. Um, and, and so all of these things, all of these publications that we've produced are at the website 
and they can be linked to from other uh, extension uh, resources, but they're found in the library tab at the top, so please visit. And also we have a cool encyclopedia function that uh, gives um, identification information and general management information on corn, soybean, and wheat diseases, and there's a keyword sort function that allows people to kind of go in and say, oh, I'm only interested in corn diseases that um, uh, are foliar and affect late in the season. They can select all those parameters and then only those diseases that meet those parameters pop up. So this is a cool way to just uh, leverage um, time or uh, 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 minimize uh, the amount of time spent on uh, uh, extension uh, publications um, and also to uh, uh, leverage the expertise. And I've got some of the publications and I'll pass these around to people too. So the next project I wanted to mention, and I'm just giving you snippets of all these things, so you can just kind of get a taste for what the IPM program does, just the same as Lena did. Uh, there's an event called the Integrated Pest Management Prop Scouting Competition for Iowa Youth. Darren and I started doing this back in 2011, and now Maya Hazlett has taken it over. Um, this is a really fun event. It's where high school and junior high kids um, form teams from all around Iowa, and then they learn um, about a variety of, of crop-related disciplines. So they learn um, uh, aspects of entomology and plant pathology, crop physiology, and then they come to the field extension education lab and they compete against the other teams. And these teams um, study up during the spring and summer and they're led by local 4-H or FFA um, teachers or even uh, uh, our winning teams have generally been led by seed dealers, which is, which is pretty neat. And so um, this allows uh, kids to learn within their community from community members, um, but it also allows them to uh, put a face on ISU extension and so they can meet entomologists and uh, plant pathologists and others who work at the university. And this is also a good opportunity for grad students if they want to get uh, their feet wet with a little bit of low-key extension work. Talk to Maya about potentially volunteering to uh, run a station at the crop scouting competition next year. Sometimes it falls during APS, so you got to watch out for that. Um, and it's pretty cool. Uh, we started it in 2011, and soon after, similar competitions formed in Nebraska, as well as Indiana. And, and now there's a regional competition for the top two teams in each state. Uh, Iowa took first to, uh, uh, the first year and the second year, because we started in 2016, but we did not win big this year. Um, Maya's done a good job. Uh, there has been interest from Minnesota and uh, Missouri forming their own state competitions as well. Just had to power down uh, the speaker here, and that's important because next we have a video about the competition. Yeah, I think it's a really nice environment. I think the people that work it are really knowledgeable. For some reason, it's really jumpy um, on this television. Going, it's not actually like questions, this. And they're very, very, very knowledgeable, which is nice. I think it's been a good learning experience for all of us. We all learned something kind of different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would make it more fun? Something slightly interesting. <laughs> no, listen. <laughs> no, I think I think it's a lot of fun. And I definitely recommend it. I'm, I'd like to do it again next year. Um, they like their fast stage. Yeah. You guys hear back there? Yeah. Show me how you did that. And I'll show you what I'm looking for. Okay, so, okay, let's move number two. People call it oh. like a button. It's also called butterfly because back many, many years ago, a long time ago, they would use it to stamp little pats of butter. The issue in the middle of the band, or even why is it so bad down here as you go up the plane? <laughs> yeah, we got important field work to do at the profession. Yeah, field work got done earlier. What are your interests when you when you graduate and then move on? Whatever it is you're gonna do. I'd like to go to Iowa State for a ground. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> right, so that video not only told about the competition, but it also added a human element to the competition. It showed some of the personality of it. And, and I think that uh, that is important when communicating uh, to people. And that brings me to my next topic, which is a partnership that the IPM program had with 4-H and the College of Design. Um, this was where we had non-scientist students designing ways to increase IPM awareness. Uh, if we were in the design college, they would call that uh, design intervention. Um, and, and anyway, what this consisted of is 10 undergrad students uh, taking a studio course in the fall of 2017 where they learned about IPM and then they examined how to solve some IPM issues. And then they presented uh, to us last December six different proposals that they came up with. And then during the spring semester, a few of those students continued to refine some of those proposals. So when they examined challenges of IPM, they, uh, uh, I, I, they identified a lack of awareness, a unified identity. Uh, they thought that information is complex and unattractive, which is how I felt after grad school. Um, they uh, had some key messages. IPM is a mindset. It's not a one-size-fits-all process. It's sustainable, an investment, and it's profitable. Uh, some opportunities for change they came up with is they would like to make IPM marketable. Uh, they talked about a community of IPM users and start at the roots. Uh, so their objectives were to increase the awareness of IPM, promote adoption of IPM, and to implement IPM across Iowa, and package IPM as an identity system. So um, just briefly here, uh, one of the proposals they developed um, was a after school or day camp program for uh, elementary school kids where the kids would do a variety of projects related to pest management and they would earn merit badge as much as you would in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts and this included uh, uh, books with activities and other things and actually um, Maya Hazlett is taking this project and um, she's going to start developing um, uh, youth activity uh, similar to this uh, based on uh, um, crops. Um, another uh, idea they came up with was uh, a block farm to kind of introduce IPM um, to the community. Another proposal they came up with was a consumer campaign to help consumers become aware of you know, crops grown with IPM as opposed to crops produced uh, organically. And they even have this neat little, uh, mocked up a neat little IPM uh, logo to go on uh, IPM grown uh, fruit much as you would with um, organic produce. And so this was cool. It allowed people who weren't immersed in pest management to, to take a look at um, some of the issues that we face and they could give it uh, a fresh look with eyes that weren't jaded. Um, and then it also allowed these students to have uh, experience um, working with, say, a difficult child. They uh, uh, compared IPM to following the speed limit. Um, and then uh, also, um, it uh, just allowed those students to learn about IPM. And so they're art students, and so maybe they can learn how to better control roaches when they go to their small studio apartment in New York someday. Um, <laughs> the, next, uh, the next project uh, was something that uh, Darren, myself, and uh, Carl Bradley and some other colleagues did um, in 2016 and 2017. Uh, to, and we used uh, social media to, uh, in an attempt to track uh, uh, corn and soybean diseases. Uh, the result of this was published as a special feature in Plant Disease just recently in an article called Scout Snap and Share about disease to tweet out the disease and we wanted them to include the Twitter accounts that we had uh, created as part of the tweet so that we would know that those tweets would post to our Twitter accounts. And so when they found a disease we wanted them to take a picture of it, we wanted them to make a diagnosis and we wanted us to, them to give us a location which included state and county and this was used to um, track uh, southern rust uh, in the 2016 and 2017 seasons. And, and, and essentially what this does is it leverages social media, it's already existing, uh, and puts it to a good use. People can look at these sites, extension specialists can look at these sites and see what feed on the ground um, are seeing in their fields and use that to help inform some of the scouting that they do. Oh, I see that southern rust is now in Illinois. Maybe I should start looking for it in my fields that are on the border of Illinois and Iowa. Or perhaps Darren sees that and decides, or Allison sees that and decides I should write a, um, a news article informing the farmers of Iowa that they should now be in their fields looking for southern rust. 
one of the last things that I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to say congratulations to Lena and Laura. They recently won the ISU Extension and Outreach Innovation Award, so way to go, guys. So they won this award for uh, a program that they uh, uh, started. It's a community of practice program. What they do is they, um, they had bi-weekly Zoom meetings where the county um, uh, horticultural specialists um, throughout the state met with the campus horticultural specialists and they shared what was going on. Um, they shared uh, timely topics on ornamental and horticultural uh, plants. And so this helped them see what was going on um, out in the counties. It helped the people um, who were in the counties to know uh, what the campus folks might be running into. And so it just better equipped both campus and uh, county horticulturalists to deal with uh, the public who would be bringing in questions and uh, samples. So it helped them to help people. So what's next for us? Well, Laura is just now getting her feet wet along with Ethan who is working for the North Central IPM Center with leading the North Central IPM Center. Uh, we've talked about the possibility of doing 360 virtual field tours with a 360 camera we have. We'd like to increase video presence, which could include more regular uh, video releases on our YouTube channel, uh, developing some online tools, and continue building on the partnerships and current outputs we have. One thing I wanted to leave you guys with is we are here to help. So the IPM program is a resource to promote pest management science and education and we're not limited to traditional extension faculty and groups. So it's common for us to uh, work with Allison Robertson or Darren Mueller or Aaron Hodgson in entomology to produce um, uh, uh, extension related things. But we can also help those who aren't necessarily traditionally uh, extension related. For example, Brandon did a video for Dr. Steve Whittem on the Envirotron. Um, and so most of what you guys are doing as part of the plant path and microbiology program is probably going to be related to pest management in some way. So let us know if we can help you communicate to your stakeholders, whether it's the public or whether it's a sponsor. You can visit our IPM YouTube channel. Just Google Iowa State University Integrated Pest Management YouTube. Uh, you can socialize I with IPM virtually on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can socialize with real IPM people. Uh, you can go upstairs to 2445 ATRB, which is the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic. That's where Laura, Lena, and Ed are. Uh, during the school year, the door is generally locked, but that's not because they don't want to see you. They do. Um, it's to help them. Uh, during, the, during the school year, they don't have someone to work the door generally, and so no bouncer, right? And so uh, that helps them to protect client confidentiality and also abide by the terms of their operating agreement and also because Ed's building a robot in one of those back rooms that can shoot laser beams out of his eyes. That's a topic for a different seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, I didn't mean to pick, you up, pick on you so much. <laughs> All right, and then so if you also want to visit the IPM communications component, uh, please come to 272 Science 1. Um, that's where Brandon, Ethan, uh, Warren during the winter time, myself and Maya Hazlett uh, hang out. Um, and I wanted to say thank you for listening to us today. Thank you for suffering through this. And we will now open it up to questions and comments that you may have. Yes, Mark. Which one? Keep going back. It was the where you're getting together with the county people. Oh yeah, oh, it yeah. was. Yeah, <laughs> we made up a song for every award winner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Why you all want your extension? Extension is crazy weird. We do cool things in extension. <laughs> All right, are there any other questions? Yes. Well, how many different uh, samples you guys process in an average year? I assume right, the summer and fall, early fall, probably 50 times. But yeah, you have an idea about how many different people you actually end up serving with questions about what does this make my plants in? Yeah, we, we have a long file where we're documenting all those things. From samples to emails to calls, we have a call log uh, that when people call and they have a question we're trying to tag the particular 
uh, pests or pathogens that they're, they're mentioning. Um, yes, we, <laughs> we do a lot of uh, counting beans. I think uh, for samples, you know, I, I, we normally put a um, end of the year review where we kind of put how many samples, what was the split, uh, which when I first arrived and I looked at the historical data, it's a lot of trees, conifers and broadleaf um, that populate that chart. Uh, and then from there, you know, the vegetables, fruits, turf, it's really a small amount. And then uh, the soil for nematodes is also a big chunk in there. But, you know. So probably a couple thousand when you include yeah. physical samples, emails, and phone calls? Maybe a little more because, okay. yeah, the, the phone calls sometimes, <laughs> the emails, they, they are, they pile up. Anyone else have anything? Thank you for listening.